All right. Uh, good to have you all back. So far, we saw how um, there was that first missionary journey where uh, various cities were uh, impacted by the ministry of Paul and Barnabas. So in the last uh, uh, image that I showed you, it was actually uh, that image was meant to uh, show the time before Paul's missionary journey. So that's why I was wondering all the arrows are you know, in the wrong places. But let me quickly put up the actual first missionary journey. <coughs> I know, I, I already showed you, but in Acts, you can't really overdo looking at the maps. So it's always nice to look at the maps. So here it is for us. We can see uh, Antioch, Seleucia, Salamis, Paphos, Perga. <coughs> uh, and then Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, Derb, back to Lystra, Iconium, return to Antioch. Uh, you know, then of course, uh, they make their way back to Perga, Italia, another place, um, and then, you know, back to Antioch to report whatever God had done among them. So that is your first missionary journey. About two years duration. All right. So now let's uh, get back to Acts chapter 15. They went twice to Egypt. They went twice to Egypt. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So Jephina was asking, they went twice to every place. That's true. That's so that they can strengthen. So they did not abandon the new believers. That's also something for us to observe. That's why I shared, right, apostolic ministry to really build people up and also to groom leaders. So that's how they worked. And they did a powerful work. You know, they uh, preached the gospel. They were filled with the Holy Spirit, signs, wonders, and miracles. And uh, I'm sure, you know, they uh, would have preached to people of uh, various uh, categories. Okay. Now let's read on uh, from Acts chapter 15. And uh, we'll see what exactly will happen over here. Now let's go to of this passage. So this passage, uh, the key feature of uh, Acts 15 is the Jerusalem Council. Now we will see throughout uh, uh, this particular chapter that there will be an issue in the church of Antioch. Uh, and to resolve the matter, uh, the leaders of Antioch will tie in with the leaders of Jerusalem because they are the final authority, because the apostles are in Jerusalem. So they will go to Jerusalem, join this uh, the primary team of apostles, make the decisions, and a decree will be sent out or released to all the believers across the region. So that is what is going to happen. So this team that decides on uh, what needs to happen is what is known as the Jerusalem Council. So Acts 15 primarily is about the Jerusalem Council. So what is going on uh, in this passage? Fine. Uh, when we come to verse 1 over here, it says, Certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren, unless you are circumcised, According to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. So, <clears throat> so far, we know that uh, uh, the teaching of the apostles, the doctrine is faith by grace, isn't it? Like they need to believe in God because of what Jesus has done. However, there is a new teaching that is coming uh, through uh, some propagators and they are saying that circumcision is essential. Without circumcision, 
you cannot be saved. Is that what uh, the apostles were preaching? Not at all, isn't it? Even when uh, you find that uh, you know Cornelius and his household got saved, it was all about putting their faith in the Lord Jesus. Acts 4, 12, salvation is found in no other name. No other name under heaven was given to men by which we must be saved. So salvation is by grace. But a wrong teaching came into being regarding works. Uh, and that particular work which they were insisting on was circumcision. Now, when Paul and Barnabas heard this, in verse 2 it says, they had no small dissension and dispute with them. That simply says that they were so upset that they almost argued with the men who were teaching this uh, uh, theology of works. And uh, they wanted to make sure, Paul and Barnabas wanted to make sure that they uh, clarify this matter to everyone. And so they decide to go up to Jerusalem, meet the apostles and elders about this question. So notice now, uh, we, we must see the progress of the church. Okay. We saw earlier, you know, Peter and John, and then slowly we saw other names, Philip, Stephen, um, and then gradually we went on to, you know, people like Paul, Barnabas, uh, John Mark. But now in Jerusalem, we also have a picture of elders. So along with the apostles, what has happened? There is the emergence of another set or second line of leadership. You have elders. Till uh, Acts 14, there is no such mention like what is elders. But now church government, we, we call this church government, evolution of church government. There is the set of <coughs> elders. Okay. And uh, Paul and Barnabas, they want to go meet this team of apostles and elders and discuss the matter. All right. So now they go there uh, and uh, uh, they report all things, you know, that God has done among them and uh, they uh, bring up this particular matter. So in verse 5, uh, they share this issue. They say, but some of the sect of the Pharisees uh, who believed rose up saying it is necessary to circumcise them and to com command them to keep the law of Moses. Okay. So uh, uh, even when they went up and they shared this matter. So what's happening is that some among the group of the council also feel like, yeah, actually, isn't it? This is what Moses taught us. Uh, he kept the custom. So what's wrong with that? So there, there is a, a difference of opinion within the council itself. And uh, we'll see how this matter will actually be settled. So let's come to verse 6. And I think uh, it may be useful for us to quickly read through it. We can read till verse 21. So someone is up for that. Acts 15, 6 to 21. Acts chapter 15. Verse 6 to 21. Now the apostles and elders came together, uh, considered this matter, and when there had been much dispute, Peter rose up and said to them, Men and brethren, you know that a good while ago God chose among us that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. So God, who knows the heart, acknowledged them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us, and made no distinction between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now therefore why do you test God by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear. But we believe that through, through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ we shall be saved in the same manner as they. Then all the multitude kept silent and listened to Barnabas and Paul declaring how many miracles and wonders God had worked through them among the Gentiles. And after they had become silent, James answered saying, Men and brethren, listen to me. Simon has declared how God at first visited the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And with this and with this, the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written. After that, 
After this, I will return and will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. I will rebuild its ruins and I will set it up so that the rest of the mankind may seek the Lord. Even all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who does all these things known to God from eternity or all his works. Therefore, I judge that we should not trouble those who those from the Gentiles who are turning to God, but that we write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from things strangled, and from blood. For Moses had through throughout many nations those who preach him in every city being read in the synagogues every Sabbath. Yeah. So uh, what we are observing here is we saw that Paul and Barnabas was, were very upset about the wrong teaching. They go to Jerusalem, they present the idea to the uh, council over there. But some of the believing Pharisees, they stand up and say, but isn't it there in the custom of Moses to actually circumcise? So what is wrong about this? Uh, there's a difference of opinion, but the matter gets discussed further. You know, whether they have to insist that circumcision is needed for the Gentiles. But after this whole, uh, you know, it, it was a difficult discussion. Uh, it, it was not easy. But when there was no conclusion, we find that uh, Peter is standing up. And he is trying to uh, uh, provide his view okay, regarding this matter. And he quotes uh, from the book of Amos, where uh, uh, God had promised that he will rebuild the tabernacle of David, uh, he will rebuild its ruins. Uh, and then po a portion of what was said by Amos was that God will uh, minister to the Gentiles and that ministers, uh, that Gentiles will come to know uh, Jesus Christ. So he's saying that God already had a heart to bring the Gentiles into the kingdom of God uh, and that the Jews should not make it difficult for the Gentiles uh, to actually be uh, accommodated right, uh, in, in that uh, uh, family of the believers. So when people come up with teachings, new teachings like this, which have no bearing in what the Lord Jesus has done on the cross, what happens is uh, an additional burden is put on the Gentiles. Uh, so he says, uh, Simon says that, uh, you know, uh, let us not put this additional responsibility on the Gentiles where we are telling them, yes, you can put your faith in the Lord Jesus, you can be born again, uh, but you still have to be circumcised to be fully saved. So that is the burden that uh, Paul is talking about. And he's saying we should not be uh, putting this additional responsibility on them. Uh, uh, however, he understands the reason why, you know, uh, some guidelines may be necessary for the Gentiles. So we have to now look at the entire believing community. Uh, it is composed of people from different backgrounds, different cultures, uh, different languages, uh, different uh, you know social standings. But peace needs to be maintained among all of them. So uh, Peter proposes, he says, the Gentiles who are coming to know the Lord, let's not say that they need to be circumcised because no such uh, requirement was given by God. But we can share some other practical guidelines for the Gentiles, which may be valid. And so he brings up this, this list. He says, abstain from things polluted to idols, from sexual immorality, and things strangled and from blood. So the Gentiles are anyway going to uh, come into the fold uh, and they don't have to be circumcised to be saved. Okay, uh, But for them to uh, really live out this holy life that they're being called to and leave behind their practices, why don't we propose uh, some of these uh, guidelines which will help them live a holy life and be integrated into the body of believers. Okay, So 
I'll just put that in a nutshell in case my communication was a little confusing for us. Uh, so what is happening is there is a requirement which is being insisted, which is circumcision. But Peter clarifies that there is no such requirement for salvation. Okay, Even if it were to be circumcision, it's not a requirement for salvation. People can be saved because of their faith. Okay, Now that matter is resolved. However, as many Gentiles are coming into the believing community, we may need to guide them using some instructions. That is to leave behind their old ways. Uh, and uh, what would they, those uh, guidelines be? Stay away from idols, worshipping of idols, sexual immorality, uh, and things which are strangled and from blood. Uh, because maybe the Gentiles had these practices which could have been disturbing for the Jewish community. Uh, and that is why they share some guidelines for the uh, Gentiles. So this is the final conclusion of uh, Peter. Now let's see how uh, the others take it. So in verse 22, uh, it's a very nice verse because in church governance, it's giving us some idea okay, uh, about uh, like a group ministry. Uh, it's not just one individual's decision where, you know, somebody decides, okay, this is what we are going to say and let's say it. But people are uh, including the others, other leaders, other elders, and then collectively coming to a conclusion. So in verse 22, it says, please the apostles and elders with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, who was also named uh, Barnabas and Silas, leading men among the brethren. And then why are they sending these men? We'll see uh, down below to give a letter. This letter clearly states the decision of the Jerusalem council, which means the entire body of leaders uh, and they're all saying the same thing what are they saying they're saying you don't need to be circumcised to be saved but if you are a gentile you need to follow certain guidelines to be part of the uh, uh, body of christ okay so that's all they're not putting an additional uh, requirement for salvation but as a uh, set of leaders with one heart they are sending across a decision. So what do we observe here? One is collective responsibility in decision making. Okay? Uh, that has started to happen. So uh, they're all happy with the decision. Earlier they were all arguing, but finally all of them are on one mind, in one mind and they say, okay, this is the final decision. Second, what do we see? The way they communicated. Now imagine if Jerusalem council had made the decision, they had discussed among themselves and kept it. Only they would know, you know, uh, uh, that circumcision is not mandatory for the Gentiles. But what they did is they wrote out a letter and they sent it uh, with a bunch of people whom they selected and said, please take it forth, go ahead, share this news, make it clear to everyone. So. You see the uh, title of that uh, letter there, it's in verse 23. Uh, it says, to the brethren who are of the Gentiles, meaning this is for the entire Gentile community in Antioch, Syria, Cilicia. So in the region where this wrong doctrine is spreading, in those regions, we are clarifying that Gentiles do not need circumcision to be saved, yet you must follow some of these guidelines. Okay, so that's uh, what actually happens. Right, so uh, we can move on from there, from the decision of uh, Jerusalem Council. And uh, let's see some more extended ministry that takes place. We'll read from verse 30 to verse 35. Would someone like to read, read through that? Oh, Pastor, can I ask one question? Yes, yes, sure, sure, uh, John. 
Yeah, Pastor, regarding the the uh, the council yeah. uh, decision or uh, the guideline which was proposed. Uh, yes. So it also mentions about uh, the food that is strangled to death. So is it uh, not allowed for e even us? Uh, I'm just thinking about how we eat pork. Yeah, yeah. So, um, see, I believe this is my understanding that uh, what was mentioned for the Gentiles may have had to do with the practices of worship. Okay, so it's not necessarily regarding um, things that they could eat because God had already clarified uh, through the vision that uh, Peter had in Acts uh, 10, uh, that don't call anything unclean and, and all. So I think from that point onwards, uh, we don't really have to worry, uh, you know, regarding all this, uh, uh, you know, which foods God is calling uh, pure and unpure, impure and all. Uh, but this has got to do more with the practices of worship of the Gentiles. So that's where there was the issue. I, I hope uh, it, it makes sense. Um, yeah, but the thing was, like some people used to take this verse, uh, no, even I have faced this. So some people used to take this verse oh, and was not supposed to eat strangled food. Yes, <laughs> because that's the, uh -huh. you know, uh, only, only this is uh, said as not to be eaten. <laughs> and that's yeah. the reason I asked. But I, I, correct, correct. But I would look at it in its context, uh, uh, John. Because earlier, like I think Acts 10 is very, very clear. Because the moment God said, don't call anything common, um, that whole law, which was there earlier, right? The, the practices, as far as the dietary practices and the customs which were given through the law of Moses, God is actually negating that. So in that one instance, we can be quite clear that, you know, uh, we don't really have to follow these customs. This particular passage is more to do with the worship of the Gentiles. So, yeah, I think I'll just <laughs> stop with that. Yes, Pastor. Yeah, th thank you. Thank you. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. Yeah. All right. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and I see one comment here in the chat. I look at it. Verse 16. Yeah. So, Jeffina is asking, uh, it says, to tell the reference of us. Okay, sure. I will do that. Um, the aim is nine. Yeah, so the, yeah, Amos 9, verses 11 and 12. So he's just repeating that, he's quoting from Amos. So uh, John, actually, uh, after this, even... Uh, Another year when I taught, someone asked me regarding apparently even blood, right? Uh, so there are some communities with the way they cook their meat. Uh, sometimes they they don't really cook it thoroughly. So uh, like even, you know, um, anyway, I don't want to get into the details of certain dishes. Uh, but even there, they had a concern. And they said, oh, what about uh, blood? Uh, uh, are we sinning against God? But then, you see, that, that's not what uh, this is actually saying. It's it's referring more to the worship practices of uh, the Gentiles. OK, now coming yes, down. Please. Okay, sure. Uh, so coming down here to uh, verse 30, verse 30 to verse 35. So after this decision was made and uh, the team was decided with the letter, 
uh, they were sent off. Uh, who are the people now in the team? Let's just have a quick look. We have uh, Paul Barnabas, which is your usual team. And then you have additionally Judas and Silas. Okay, So they are the ones who are joining uh, Paul and Barnabas. I'm coming to verse 30. This team, they came to Antioch. And when they had gathered the multitude together and delivered the letter, when they had read it, they rejoiced over its encouragement. Now Judas and Silas, themselves being prophets, also exhorted and strengthened the brethren with many words. So remember, I was telling you, multicultural team, okay? You could even say multidisciplinary team in the sense that teachers we already had, okay? We, we had Nikor and uh, Mane, Maneus, all those names. Uh, your uh, Paul and Barnabas, they are teaching. Uh, but now you have prophets, Silas and Judas. Who are they? Prophets. And they are encouraging, exhorting, strengthening. Remember when we studied about prophecy, that's what we said. Uh, uh, prophecy, exhort, edify, comfort the people. So the prophets have now come in. And what are they doing? They're doing their function or their role of encouraging the people, strengthening the people with prophetic words. Now in verse 33, and after they had stayed there a while, for a while, for a time, they were sent back with greetings from the brethren to the apostles. Okay, so they did their ministry and returned. However, Silas remained here. And you notice that Silas will now team up with uh, um, uh, Paul and uh, start off on the second missionary journey very soon. Uh, so for some time now, after the message <coughs> or the decree was uh, passed, uh, you find Paul and Barnabas remaining in Antioch, their home church. And what are they doing there? They continue to build up their own people. So they are teaching and preaching the word of God. Uh, with many others also. So that's a very encouraging passage. There are lots of people, lots of leaders now who are serving together in the church of Antioch. Now, let's talk about this uh, person known as John Mark. Remember, we uh, saw earlier in Acts 13 that he left the team uh, during the first missionary journey. Uh, but after coming back from the Jerusalem Council, they have this thought of going on the next missionary journey. And what happens is uh, there is a proposal from Barnabas to take John Mark along. So just quickly read those lines from verse 36. Then after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let us now go back and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. Now Barnabas was determined to take with them John called Mark. Okay, now comes the problem. Verse 38, but Paul insisted that they should not take with them the one who had departed from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. Then the contention became so sharp that they parted from one another. Can you imagine? These guys, they have done ministry together, uh, facing opposition, and you know, uh, they they have a you know they, their history goes way back. Barnabas was the one who convinced the apostles that Paul is a, a true minister of the gospel, and so much has happened okay, in, in their uh, history. But now, regarding a matter about John Mark, they both are not able to see eye to eye. Uh, and uh, it gets bad because uh, the passage here says they had a contention and it became so sharp. Meaning they probably had an argument. They probably had, a, uh, you know, uh, like, a, I don't know uh, what exact word to use, but it ended up in both of them parting ways. So definitely it wasn't good uh, whatever happened. Why do things like this happen among uh, ministers? Any any thoughts regarding that? Both are good ministers of God. You know, we have no uh, uh, point here that says you know something was wrong with Paul's doctrine or Barnabas's doctrine or their 
you know attitudes no but they still had an issue between both of them what could have been the problem here okay. yeah you speak it to the yeah i i think because ultimately we are all humans in the end sure. and uh, we may have different desires friendships and uh, that's one thing i see here that uh, he definitely wants done work with him and paul says no and i think that's maybe because just because we are humans we have different thoughts and desires yeah, yeah. sure so that's true uh, jeffina i think we must see how god works with us uh, he has given all of us personalities uh, and uh, somewhere those personalities become an integral part of the way uh, in which we minister uh, so it may not be all that easy to work alongside other people who have a different um, personality altogether and sometimes you have personalities which clash but we are all ministers of god and we are supposed to work together and you know unfortunately a situation like that came in the life of paul and barnabas uh, we know paul to be this super passionate man who cannot you know, like a no nonsense uh, person uh, but at the same time you know barnabas is so gracious uh, and accommodating and uh, he thinks the best uh, uh, of every individual and uh, he probably is the one who is quick to forgive and analyze the situation some more and you know uh, way way the matter better or more deeply uh, so both of them having this difference in the way they approach uh, matters ended up clashing okay now we can always ask the question could they have done this better maybe maybe they could have uh, discussed it in a better way that they didn't have to part ways and make two separate teams uh, but yeah it happened okay and the luke records it that uh, they parted ways now what would have happened if they never parted ways and uh, barnabas continued with paul what kind of ministry would they have done we don't know so these are all questions that remain unanswered um, uh, but some lessons for us to learn we must realize we will meet people who are different from us when we are serving the lord they will have uh, you know a, a, a difference of opinion or a different way of doing things but we must make every effort to work with unity as far as is possible the bible says live peaceably with everyone uh, and uh, uh, maybe some situation like this you know parting ways and all it it's best avoided uh, and uh, we too could you know work uh, on ourselves in order to see these things happen so this is how matters work uh, but you see it's it this is not the end of the story okay because uh, we will read uh, later on uh, paul he writes in the uh, first corinthians Wait, let me just check that passage colossians yeah no he writes in timothy requesting for john mark to come and join him let me just tell you which ah yeah so uh, he says in second timothy 4 and verse 11 uh, he makes this statement later on in his life okay and second timothy is uh, towards the end of his life when you know he writes to timothy and he says things like i fought the good fight of faith i have finished the race so we can also uh, assume okay it's an assumption that now paul is more mature you know and he has raised many leaders so that father heart which he uh, was developing has come to full bloom and so at that point in his life 
early in his life passionate young man he saying forget about john mark what a you know what a guy he could not even finish he just midway stopped the journey so he's not uh, good enough to continue the race with us but towards the end of his life he says verse 11 second timothy 4 only luke is with me take mark and bring him with uh, with you for he is profitable to me for the ministry and then we wonder paul what happened to you you know are you the same person we are ready to accept john mark now but uh he may have found out the actual reason why you know john left and uh, um you know now he's more forgiving of of people when he's much older and uh, his view has changed uh, but yeah a very sad situation here paul and barnabas actually part ways so then what happens now that uh, paul does not want mark they parted ways so what are the two teams which are formed now uh, and also notice they are not going alone usually they go at least two people in a team for their missionary journey so barnabas is taking mark and he sails to cyprus you remember the map we saw right you you need to go to the island of cyprus so barnabas is going there and paul he chose silas silas who came from jerusalem didn't go back or silvanus is another name which is usually used for silas so silas is with him paul and silas they depart also okay and uh, uh, the church of antioch the leaders of antioch they uh, they encourage them they pray for them uh, and uh, then they set out these two teams now paul and silas they went through syria cilicia strengthening the churches okay so uh, the work still continues and they are moving on now let's see the very specific second missionary journey which will be undertaken uh, now for whatever reason you see paul uh, luke is bringing the focus back to paul in a very strong way remember i mentioned right we started with peter and then uh, there was uh, uh, the church of antioch paul and barnabas acts 11 then slowly even when the first missionary journey started barnabas is on the team luke is still talking more you know regarding paul and uh, now after acts 15 it's completely about paul uh, there is another team barnabas and mark but we don't really see anything mentioned by luke about that particular team but he starts to talk about paul and silas and where exactly they travel so let me now show us the image of the second missionary journey and then we can start to talk about it okay so here we go so this is uh, more like the second missionary journey which was uh, longer earlier you know we just said uh, what year or two years that that's what, what the first missionary journey duration was the second one is uh, around 3 years time uh, and all the journeys obviously they start from antioch and we said right that uh, paul and silas they spent some time strengthening the churches in syria cilicia so somewhere here they are uh, you know serving the lord and then they will continue on to the same churches where they had ministered early earlier um, uh, derb lystra iconium antioch of syria but from this region okay uh, led by the holy spirit they will move on to the region of macedonia shortly so that is part of the second missionary journey in macedonia we will see some important places um uh, you know places port places like neapolis uh, where uh, business used to happen it's close to the sea 
um, and then uh, places like Philippi, which are also prominent cities uh, of uh, the region. And you know, uh, they'll just move on from here. So they'll cover the Macedonian region. We'll see how they'll come to uh, a place called as Thessalonica. Uh, in all the places, even from Philippi, they'll start facing opposition as usual. Uh, but some severe opposition in Philippi, severe opposition in Thessalonica. From there, again, they'll escape off, escape to a place called Beria. And uh, from the Macedonian region, we will find that they will then move on to the next region here, which is the Achaean region. Okay, the Achaean region. And a prominent, prominent place now, in the Achaean region that we will learn about is Corinth. Okay, Corinth is another very major popular city uh, in uh, uh, this place. So the ministry of Paul over here uh, is, is something that we will look at. We'll also see how he will minister to people in a place known as Athens. It's an intellectual city where uh, you have philosophers, thinkers, and Paul will have a certain approach to minister to the people of Athens. Uh, and then eventually we'll find that, you know, the, the journey will go on to the Asia uh, minor region once again. And a popular city by the name of Ephesus is where Paul will minister. Now, this place, Ephesus, is also, uh, you know, quite important uh, later on as the church of Ephesus. We'll, we'll see a, uh, a long stretched ministry in Ephesus. So there'll be a, a, a school of Tyrannus where uh, Paul will station himself and he will start to teach the word of God for, uh, you know, uh, uh, over a year. And uh, uh, this in Ephesus, okay, this uh, place, uh, people from the rest of the region, they'll come to Ephesus, they'll learn from the teachings of Paul. And so a great impact happened through uh, the ministry of Paul in Ephesus. And when the church of Ephesus is strengthened, you know, we'll also see that eventually he will assign uh, uh, Timothy as the leader okay, for the church of Ephesus. Okay, so uh, that is also part of a second missionary journey. Uh, once he completes that, you know, he will move on. And the usual way is to go back, right? Go back to Antioch. But this time, at the end of the uh, journey, he would just prefer to go to Syria, uh, Sicilia and uh, Jerusalem and then move on to Antioch. So this is the way in which the second missionary journey will happen. So I want you to look at the map so that at least the, the names are familiar. Then the stories will make more sense for us as we go ahead. Okay. Uh, so let's now come to Acts chapter 16. Uh, and uh, we said, right, that Paul is still in Syria, Cilicia, ministering. Uh, let's see how the team, Paul and Silas, uh, are making their journey. So uh, it says in early uh, Act 16, verse 1, he came to Derb and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timothy. So what's happening uh, as the journey is taking place? Paul is keen on identifying new ministers of God. So he finds this young man, Timothy, a certain disciple, it says, meaning uh, nothing prominent about Timothy just yet. Uh, but there is a connection which Paul feels with Timothy. Uh, and uh, so he starts to work with Timothy. What is Timothy's background? Timothy, he had a Jewish mother, Okay, who believed, but his father was Greek. So because his father was Greek, um, he may not have kept the customs, the Jewish customs. Okay, that's our assumption. Now, uh, this Timothy, he had a good testimony in verse 2. Uh, it says here in Acts 16, he was well spoken of by the brethren who were at Lystra and Iconium. So we can see that you know, he's a young person, but he has a good testimony. 
uh, he's uh, probably serving God very well. And uh, Paul feels a connection with this young man. And he sees his destiny that God has called this young man for something great in the future. Now, Paul starts to work with him. So in verse 3, uh, Paul wanted to have him go on with him. So it teaches us about mentoring. How is Paul mentoring uh, you know, people in this journey? One good way to mentor people is just take them with you. Because when we do stuff, whether we are teaching, preaching, or we are even just like, you know, in a, um, they observe us in our everyday life, the way we behave, the things, the decisions that we make, uh, our lifestyle, they can understand you know, how a minister of God should be uh, and uh, what are the standards expected, uh, how, how should one minister. So that way, Paul was very courageous. He was open to let people see his life and uh, follow that same pattern. So to mentor Timothy, he decides, okay, come on, let's take Timothy along with us and uh, let him observe, let him learn because he's, he has a good testimony. He's a good young man. So he takes him. But you see here, Paul is thinking about Timothy, not just for now, but he's thinking about the future of Timothy. You know, parents, that's how parents think for their children, isn't it? Uh, maybe the children uh, don't uh, know what to study when they're in their uh, high school years but the parents guide them they say hey you're so talented in commerce you're so talented in this biology you study this your future will be secure so parents are thinking way ahead maybe decades ahead to ensure that the child's future is safe so paul is being a spiritual father to timothy and he's telling timothy uh, or uh, he, he's looking at timothy and he sees one problem this boy can be a minister of the Lord, but he will not be accepted by the Jews. You know why? Because his father was Greek and his mother would not have kept the Jewish customs for him. So what does uh, Paul do for Timothy? To make Timothy more acceptable, he uh, utilizes his background that, yeah, there is some Jewish connection in Timothy's life. But how about uh, I get him circumcised? Because if Jews ask Timothy in the future, are you circumcised? At least Timothy will say, I'm circumcised. Then uh, culturally, he'll be more acceptable and the people will be willing to accept his ministry. So Paul thought like that, like a spiritual father for Timothy. And uh, he, he got Timothy circumcised early on in the journey so that in the future, when Timothy does his ministry, you know, as Timothy discovers his uh, destiny, as a bishop of the church of Ephesus. Later we'll see that he was the one who was appointed as the pastor of that wonderful church of Ephesus. But Paul had already ensured that Timothy had better chances of being accepted by the people. And that shows the heart of a spiritual father who is mentoring the disciples, who is guiding the uh, you know the, the sons or the disciples to help them become strong and establish themselves in the ministry that God is calling them to do. Okay, so I think with that we would uh, just uh, pause for today. Uh, if there are any questions, we can address it. If not, we can pray and close. Sure. All right. Then, and I see the comments uh, here in the chat. Zeli has shared, you know, regarding the culture, uh, Naga culture. She says uh, uh, blood and pork and beef. Uh, yeah, uh, Zeli. So uh, I think there's nothing to worry because in the context that we saw earlier, it basically had to do with the Gentile practices of worship. Okay. So let's close, and I request one of us to uh, please pray as we wrap up today's class. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you under the name of Jesus. We thank you for this day. We thank you for the class that we had. We thank you for everything that we are learning through the life of Paul Jesus. We thank you that uh, you choose us, you call us, and God, uh, 
fill us with wisdom like Paul, like where we should speak, where we should not speak speaking and how we should speak how we should reach out to the people how we should uh, use the opportunities and how we as believers uh, sh stood or should always stand together uh, so that we can uh, move much more boldly for your kingdom jesus every single thing that we are learning on uh, how to reach out the people uh, the character things that we are learning how to be a spiritual father how to be united in our faith i just pray god everything that we are learning we will put into practice and god we will uh, do much more greater works for your kingdom we thank you for nancy ma'am we thank you for the knowledge that she is imparting to us i thank you for all the classmates we bless everyone over here in the name of jesus in jesus name i pray amen Amen, amen. Thank you. Thank you, Jeffina. Thank you, everyone. God bless you. Uh, we'll uh, close for now. Have a blessed day and a, a wonderful weekend ahead. Bye.